You are in Christ Jesus. What's the difference between that and what we just read in Colossians? It's the opposite. Yes. By God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became, past tense, to us what? Wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Did God ask you permission to do that to you? No. He didn't ask me either. Why did He do it without asking His permission? Because of His love. And because in the plan of salvation in heaven, recorded in Revelation 13 8, the three members of the God had said, if there is a mess up here, who's going to step up and pay the price that we have determined is the price for sin? Jesus did. So Jesus steps up and says, okay. So that is what Paul is writing about here in 1 Corinthians 1 30. By God's doing, the human race is where? Alive in Christ. Yes. Who became for us what? Wisdom from God. And righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Here we're back to what? Whether Jesus identified with us at the incarnation. <laughs> it is impossible for Paul to make that statement since he didn't ask his permission. It's impossible for him to make that statement if Jesus had not ethically and legally identified with us at the incarnation. Do you understand that? Amen. <clears throat> So that's the first phase of salvation. By God's doing, by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. What did we learn in Hebrews 10, 5? A body was made for whom? For him. There you have the ethical and legal terms of the first phase of salvation. Now let's go back to Colossians chapter 1. I'm sorry. Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> Who would like to read verses 6 and 7 of Colossians chapter 2? Right over here. As you have therefore let him receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, uh, rooted and built up in him, and established in the truth, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Thank you. So as you have what? Received Christ Jesus which is the first phase of what? Grace. As you have received Him, now what? You reflect Him in your life. The Holy Spirit guarantees to do that. We must say, do it. That's our participation. Do it. Do we understand the two phases of salvation? The objective is what Christ Holy Spirit and God put us in Christ. The subjective is what? Experiencing Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's what Paul is saying. This world has never seen that. But ethically and legally did the Godhead put the human race in Christ Jesus. Yes. According to 1 Corinthians 1.30. Yes. Yes. Unfortunately, not everyone chooses to say what? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. So, if they hadn't done that, Father and Son, then Adam and Eve would have ceased to exist the moment they sinned. Right. Right. Everything hangs on that concept of the two phases. And the first phase is impossible unless Jesus identified with me at the Incarnation. Are we absolutely clear on this? I'm not asking you to believe it. I'm not asking you to like it. I'm just asking you, does the Word of God say it? Yes. Yes. What you do with it is your personal choice. Okay? Welcome. There is a Sabbath school class for juniors. Okay. Without this light shining through us, how effective will it be to proclaim the gospel? It's a waste of time. Yes. It's impossible. Completely, completely, 100% unproductive. 
<clears throat> so Paul was not to preach about Christ, but Paul was to preach what? Christ himself. Let's take a look at that. 2 Corinthians 4, 5. Volunteer to read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Lois? For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. Very clear. They do not preach what? Themselves. Themselves. But what? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. So, if you really believe this, and you have verified it from your personal studies in the Bible, why in the name of common sense would you ever reference some member of the human race who has dedicated their lives to the study of the Bible? Well, why would you reference them when this is inspired and regardless of how knowledgeable, how brilliant, how well educated another member of the human race might be, why would you reference them? Makes no sense. God is very anxious and very capable of reproducing his character through you. Amen. Once you understand what the Godhead has accomplished for the human race. But he needs a willing vessel. Because he will not force himself on any one of us. So the visual evidence of grace, the Bible calls sanctification. The visual evidence of grace, the Bible calls sanctification. What is sanctification? When you and I Choose to turn every thought, every word, and every act over to whom? How many forces are trying to draw us to themselves on this planet? Two. Two. It is your and my choice to determine which one of these we're going to respond to. From the moment that I awaken in the morning to the time that I go to sleep at night, those two forces are drawing me to that. And it is my choice, mind, words, and activities, to be controlled and influenced by one of those two forces. What is the daily challenge that you and I are faced with in experiencing the visual aspect of grace which is sanctification. What is the personal challenge that you and I face every day? Let's take a look at it. Romans 8, 7. Romans 8, 7. When you get there, say ready, and I will quote it for you. Romans 8, 7. Ready? Ready. The carnal mind is enmity against God and not subject to the law of God, and even if it tries to be, it can't. That describes me 100% accurate. That's the way I wake up every morning. When I wake up every morning, everything that I naturally want to do is either bad, illegal, in my case, fattening. <laughs> and I'm not trying to amuse you. You may not have that last problem. That is the way that I naturally am. I don't have to try to be bad. I am bad. So what is the solution? Because that's my dilemma. Turn two verses to the right. Say chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. Who would like to read verses 9 and 10 for us? Over here, Abby. For you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And indeed, the spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. The spirit is life. What does the word if mean? I have a choice to make. To which of these two parties am I going to what? Listen to. 
And that's what the word obey means. Submit, subordinate your will. So that's the solution. You are no longer under the influence of the flesh, but of, of the Spirit, if, so be it, that the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. Because if the Spirit of Christ does not dwell in you, I don't care what day you go to church, how you dress, or what your diet is. You do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, what does that mean? I have given the Holy Spirit permission to do what? Come in and take over. That is grace. The divine influence on the life and then the reflection outward. That is the visual aspect of grace. The Bible calls it sanctification. Let's take a look at verses 13 and 17 of Galatians chapter 1. Who would like to volunteer to read that for us? Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. Over here, Diane. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Ju Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal the Son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Thank you. Why did Paul persecute the church so violently, violently and try to destroy it? He was zealous teaching the Yeah. He was what? Zealous. zealous of the teaching of who? Verse 14. Paul was doing exactly, though, what he had been taught to do as a child <coughs> and as an adult. And he grows, it goes into great detail to explain it when he's really in a tough spot. Do you remember? After one of his missionary journeys, he returns to Jerusalem. He's recognized in the temple. They grab him and try to tear him apart. Someone steps in and saves his life physically. Then he goes through a series of appeals where he's heard. And he finally appears before King Agrippa. Let's turn to, this is an incredible passage. Turn to uh, Acts 26. Acts 26. I'm going to read it to you. This is absolutely incredible. Acts 26. When you get there, say ready and I'll read. Amen. Acts 26. Beginning with verse 9, then 10. And then 11. Here we go. So, King Agrippa, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. 10. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priest, but I also, when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them, saying, yes. Eleven. And as I punished them, often, in all the what? I tried to force them to say something that would be blaspheming. Why? Because the Jews had the right, they taught them, that if someone blasphemes, they have the right to what? Stone them to death. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. So he's telling us right here that he's doing exactly what he has been taught to do as a child. To anything that had to do with the gospel or with Christianity. Judaism, however, was not the religion of God or of Jesus. Judaism is 100% human religion. Many people mistakenly associate Judaism with the Old Testament. The Old Testament no more teaches Judaism than the New Testament teaches Romanism. Amen. 
The religion of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So when Paul was in Judaism, he didn't believe the Old Testament. Some people say, what? He didn't believe the Old Testament, which he read how frequently? All the time, every day. Daily. The reason he didn't believe the Old Testament is because the Old Testament is the religion of Christ. When Paul was in Judaism, he did not only not believe the Old Testament, but he didn't understand it either. But he read it every day. What is the problem? If Paul had understood the Old Testament, I'm using the word understood. If Paul had understood the Old Testament, he would have accepted Jesus Christ instantly. And we have evidence of this from Paul himself. Let's take a look at uh, Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verses 26 and 27. Who would like to read that for us? This is Paul, a converted man, and what he's now teaching about the Old Testament. Acts 13, 26 and 27. Who would like to read that? Over here, Carl. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of the salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, who which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. There you have it. From Paul the expert in Judaism. Now converted, he's saying what? All the things that we've been heard, that we've heard since childhood that has been written, that, that has been written and read to us. There's no validity to it. It is 100 percent invalid. Let's take a look at uh, John chapter 5, 46 and 47. John chapter 5, 46 and 47. Who would like to read that for us? Over here, Linda. For if you believe Moses, you believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? There you have it. So you can memorize the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, but not understand the thing that you've memorized. That's the point here. What did the traditions of the elders bring about in Jesus' day? What kind of an attitude? Let's turn to Matthew 15. Matthew 15, verses 1 and 2. The Jews had about 369 things that you needed to do and not do, or you were not going to be saved. One of the things that they believed was that you could not, if you were going to travel from here to, and you were walking, to downtown New Smyrna Beach, you were not allowed to take any water in the event that you got thirsty. You were allowed to carry a little flask about the size of half of a shell of, of, of an egg, carry it with you. And when you came across some water, then you could dip the little shell in, drink the water. That was okay. This applied to taking anything with you or doing something on Sabbath that was not acceptable. Who would like to read Matthew 15, verses 1 and 2? Over here. Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Hang on. Thank you. 
What's the problem? Another of the 369 things that you could not do is that you could not eat anything unless you first what? And you did that with this little cup, size of half of an egg. So you had to find water, then pour it. That's what they're that's what they're attacking Jesus. They're not attacking him directly. They quit doing that in chapter 12. Now in 15, they're attacking him through his disciples and saying to him, How can you allow your disciples to eat without having washed their hands? How does Jesus respond in verse 3? Who would like to read that? Matthew 15. The answer and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandments of God because of your tradition? Thank you. Completely ignores their question yeah. and goes right at the issue. Which is what? Why do you transgress the commandments of who? God. For your what? Tradition. Tradition. Now he gets into a little detail of another issue in verses 4, 5, and 6, and 7. And now, uh, uh, six, now take a look at verse 7 and 8. Who would like to read verse 7 and 8 of Matthew 15? Anyone? Volunteer. Over here again. Hypocrites, while did Isaiah uh, prophesied about you saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Do you like for anyone to waste your time? Huh? No. You're not for anyone to waste your time. No. Well, that's what Jesus is saying here. You people that have exchanged the Word of God for your traditions are worshiping me in what? You're wasting your time. So it's quite obvious that the Jewish teachers were not teaching the Galatians the Word of God, right? Okay. Had they been teaching them the Word of God, they would have believed whom? Moses, who understood the Gospel. What these Jewish teachers are doing to the Galatians is leading them away from the Scriptures and substituting their traditions for God's Word for their traditions. In verse 15, Paul says of Galatians 1, he shares his conviction of how he was converted. He also says, at what point in time was he converted? At what point in time, not he converted, I misread it, explain that. At what point in time does he tell us in verse 15 that God chose him for his life work? From birth. From birth. Can you think of other people that were chosen at birth Jeremiah. for their life work? Who? Jeremiah. Yes. John the Baptist. <clears throat> Yes. Yes. Samson. Yes. It is crucial for us to be aware that these are not isolated cases. Let me read to you a portion of 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4 and Mark 13, 14. He who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, has also appointed to each man his own work, Mark 13, verse 14. So does God call everyone to be an evangelist? No. Does God call everyone to be a witness for Him? Yes. So, based on our ability, God chooses us to accomplish something very specific for Him. If you accept that call, I have news for you. Your life will be transformed. Since God does the calling, is it reasonable to assume that God also chooses the specific work that He has in mind for you? In Jeremiah 10, 23, it says, It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. It is in God to choose the steps and the direction that He wants for us to go. After God deprogrammed Paul for three years in Arabia, Paul went to Jerusalem for 15 days and conferred with Peter and with Jesus' brother, James. And then he left. So it's quite apparent that Paul did not learn the gospel from any member of the human race, including Peter or Jesus' half-brother. This 
is absolutely crucial for us to recognize, folks. When someone reads a passage in the Bible, and they read something that maybe they've never read before, or never even heard before, and they say to themselves, No way! I cannot believe this! There's no way that this can be true. What's the first likely thing that they will do? Call the pastor. Or the first elder. Or the Sabbath school teacher. Or a friend that they have learned to respect and accepted their friend's opinions. And, to continue this parable, if these individuals, the pastor, the first elder, the Sabbath school teacher, or the friend, reads this passage and they say the same thing, this is beyond human comprehension. And they get back to the person that originally read it. What is the likelihood that that person that originally read that passage will believe what that passage says? Very unlikely. When we study the Bible using that approach, what's going to happen? Flesh and blood has gained the victory, and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God has been set aside as to its credibility. How does Jesus instruct us to teach, to read His Word? Let's take a look at John 14, 26. John 14, 26. I'm going to read these because I am running out of time. John 14, 26. When you're there, say ready and I'll read. Ready. John 14, 26. But the Helper, in case you wonder who that was, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you how many things? All things. That word all is a very important word in the Greek language. It's pantes, and it means it's all-inclusive. It does not exclude anything. All things. And bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Do you like that? The question is, do we trust Him? Okay, let's flip to the right to John 16, 13. This is very, very interesting. John 16, 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will disclose to you what is to come. Do you find that interesting? That each member of the Godhead knows exactly what their function is? and doesn't step on the side of someone else's function, someone else being the Father or Jesus. That's what it's saying right here. When the Holy Spirit comes, He will know what? On, and on, in the, on His own initiative. When you and I are giving a Bible study, should you and I speak on our own initiative or when some scholar says? Who should we reference our statements from? Yes. Yes. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. When you're there, say ready, and I'll read. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Consider what I say. For the Lord will give you understanding in what? Everything. So when we are dialoguing with each other or sharing with each other, what should we say? In studying this passage, I was impressed to look a particular word up, and this is what I found out the word means from the dictionary. Now you have shared something with someone that they can say, wow, I never understood the meaning of that word before. Does that make sense? Okay. We already read 1 John chapter 2.26. So I won't go there. A man that I have a great deal of respect for, he's passed away, where he and I were engaged in a conversation. And I was picking his brain, and he found out that I had a little bit of background studying the Bible. So he said, uh, what... 
got you, what gave you the understanding of Scripture that you're sharing with me? And I said, God introduced me to two words in the English language that I never heard of before. The first word is exegesis, E-X-E-G-E-S-I.